Hi, I'm Maggie. Thank you for stopping by Crafts the Charm today. You are most welcome here. And here today is my tropical garden. Tropical is so called because I live in growing zone six and you can't grow tropical plants in growing zone six year round. In fact, I'll put a picture here of this spot where I'm sitting that I took in February. So this video is going to have two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about the garden and give you a little tour. So talk about my inspiration, show you what I have of before and after and during pictures so that you can see the process of creating this garden. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about two plants and you can see some of them behind me that are tropical plants, but that you can overwinter. And in the next year, you'll have even more of them. So you should never have to buy these plants more than once. As always, I'm going to put chapters in the video, so if you want to skip to that part, you can. But if you don't, please come take a tour of my garden with me. Let's go. To start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my inspiration for this yard. I think having an inspiration helps you to keep your design cohesive. So. From the pool, this is basically your view, is, is this yard that surrounds the pool, and it really wasn't very attractive. So I knew I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what. And there was one thing, one problem that I hadn't solved that was really tripping me up, and that was the retaining wall. I didn't like the blocks that I was using temporarily, and I looked a lot of places for retaining wall blocks, just it's just a short retaining wall the one um, on the right side of the yard but I couldn't find anything that I liked and then I had an inspiration which was Disney's Polynesian Resort I love Disney's Polynesian Resort I have been fortunate enough to stay there a few times often because of the generosity of others and I think it's just such a relaxing, beautiful place, particularly the outdoor areas, but also the tropical motifs. So I decided to create a retaining wall like the little separating walls at Disney's Polynesian Resort. And I thought I would try to include as many tropical plants as I could. Now, I would have loved to have used white sand instead of pea stone. And I would have loved to have used black stones instead of the black cedar mulch that I'm using here. I didn't use sand because I was worried about animals using the sand as a sort of a litter box, so that's why I used the pea stone. And black stones would have been prohibitively expensive. And believe it or not, I even tried to spray paint rocks. Um, to use your less expensive rocks, but they just it did not work. They looked terrible So I thought black mulch was maybe the second best thing So now you know what my inspiration is and let's now jump into the garden tour I'm going to start the tour here and I hope that the audio works I'm using a lapel mic which I haven't done before but my neighbor is running his truck next door and we have this little fountain in our pool and that makes such a pretty noise. So imagine if you're in the pool and the view from the pool is the foundation of the house. That was my first project, was covering up that foundation. Now I'm going to insert some video of what I used to cover up the foundation and a little bit of voiceover explaining how I did that right here. You can get a little glimpse of just how terrible the foundation is here. And in fact, when we turn the corner, you'll see it on the other side. And eventually I'm sure we'll get to fixing up and painting the foundation. But for now, what I had done was ordered these tiles and they're the sort of tiles that you can snap together and put down on, I guess, a concrete surface or you could put them down in the grass and it would give you a little bit of a solid flooring. So you can see that on the back of them, they have a sort of a plastic grid, which allows you to snap them together. And you could make, for example, a big square or rectangle with them. 
So what I did was, because you can see that they're not the same color as my deck, I found, I couldn't find one stain, I found a couple of stains that when I stained wood with them one after the other, in fact one and then two and then one again, I got a color that was similar to the color of my deck. So I stained them, and then I needed to build a sort of a base, and I wanted this to be easily removable. So for the base I used just scrap lumber that I had, um, looks like a one by two, and then I ripped disassembled some of these tiles and I ripped the boards so that they were thinner and I put some in the back and some in the front and that gave me a, sort of a channel that I could slide the tiles into and then I just snapped it under my deck. Now moving on with the tour. Then if we keep walking you get to some stairs and you can go down into my garden. And now just a general overview of this part of the garden. There's garden there against the fence, and then there's a gate, and that's because of the pool, and a walkway. And over close to the house is really just utilitarian. And now to the left, there's a small garden, a little peninsula, and this is just sort of masking the pool. So you can see the pump and the filter. The little garden is edged all the way to the deck. So unfortunately, I don't have before pictures. I think I have an aversion to before pictures because this yard, it didn't go from like good to great or even poor to good it went from truly disgusting to what you see here. And I think I don't take before pictures because I'm really embarrassed about what things look like before. I wish I had. But I do have a whole series of transitional pictures starting somewhere in the middle. And I found some older pictures of what this yard looked like, but, but just pieces of it. So you can't really see the whole thing but I'm going to insert here some of those transitional pictures with voiceover to show you how I created this yard. So how I did the walkway, how I did the edging, and how I planned the garden and what plants were in it. This is the earliest picture I have of this garden before. Although, as I said, I have snapshots of little pieces of it and somebody took a picture of me while I was working on it. So we always had to have a little bit of a retaining wall on the right, and you can sort of see to the left of me a stack of blocks. Those were blocks that I had just laid along where I'm putting in retaining wall, and that was our retaining wall for the longest time, and they weren't really set into the ground or glued together or anything, so they were always falling down. And you can see also that I just have a bunch of pieces of tarp laid down on the ground in that utilitarian area. And um, so weeds would come through and obviously it, it just looks terrible. You can also see a little bit that I have a little bit of a walkway in this yard already that I had put in. So you can see in the foreground one by one pavers. And those one by one pavers I had put in to go all the way around the pool. So if we did want to uh, use the wheelbarrow and, and move something, around, we could use that little skinny one by one path. So I do have all of those one by one pavers. And then closer to the gate, my dad had given me some 16 by 16 pavers. And those are by the gate. So there's a slightly wider area when you come through the gate. Now, over on the left, there's a retaining wall that I had put in a long time ago, and it's just rocks. So it's just huge rocks under the ground on the left. And then this yard used to be really sloped. I had filled it in with dirt again a long time ago. So those huge rocks are all underground. And what I did was I dug up all of those rocks and I put in the retaining wall bricks. And this time I put them in properly so that that would be neat on the left side over there. And what you can see me doing on the right is I have landscaping timbers that I have stained using the same technique as I did for what I covered the foundation with and then cut them and they are cut in lengths that are either 8 inches or somewhere between 12 and 14 inches and the way I put them in is there are 
eight inch sections, maybe uh, four in a row, and then a 10 or 12 inch piece. So every, say, five pieces, there's a piece that's really, really deep. They're all buried a good uh, at least three, four inches, but the 10 or 12 inch ones, of course, are buried incredibly deep. And then these are held together with these huge nails. I think they're called pole barn nails. I have a little video showing you how those are nailed in here. So I had to drill a hole through each one and nail them together. And that's why this retaining wall is a little bit wonky because it was really hard for me to nail them together exactly aligned and also get them in the ground exactly aligned. It was a lot, um, but it is an incredibly strong retaining wall. Once I had them in, then I went back and stained the tops of them. You can see I have hidden back here some of the leftover landscaping timbers in case I ever need to replace one or in case I want to extend or create a new garden. I have a little bit left over. Now because that technique was so time consuming and because it didn't come out perfectly straight, on the other side, the garden side, I used a different technique. And this was partly because this side wasn't as important. It's not really a retaining wall. It's really just separating the garden from the walkway area. And when I put it in, I hadn't leveled out the walkway area. So it's actually um, buried quite deep. These are the same length as the ones on the other side, eight inches for most of them, and then 12 to 14 inches for the longer ones. But instead of using the pole barn nails, I'm using screws. And I don't remember the length, but they're quite long. I want to say at least three inches. And these are the sort of screws that are supposed to drill through wood by themselves, although for some of them I did have to drill a pilot hole. But they're screwed from one of the pieces of landscaping timber into its neighbor to hold it together. And this side really feels just as dirty as the other side, and that could partly be because they're buried so deep. But I felt the screws did a really good job of holding it together, and I was able to get them positioned better before I connected them together. So this side is neater. Now this is a series of photos that shows the progress after the point of the picture that somebody took of me, so more on the left side. But this first picture, it was actually just a picture of how well the power washer cleaned these chairs, but you can see in the background my old rock retaining wall, and you can see how messy it is. I was really frustrated with that because I couldn't put anything neatly on top of it, and that's why I decided to just completely excavate it and start over. So these next two pictures show how I had that block retaining wall down and then I laid landscaping timbers across that to raise it up a little bit and to edge the garden with something that looked like what I was putting in the front. And then I did the old trick of using a hose to lay out the shape of the garden, although you don't see that here. Here I've cut all the landscaping timbers and dug a trench and put them in where the hose was but some of them here are already connected together, the ones to the left and the ones to the right I haven't connected together or leveled out yet. Now, three days later, I had finished the edging on that side and I had already picked out and started to plant some plants. So I started on the left side with the hosta and some of the canna lilies, and then I had picked out more canna lilies and day lilies, and you can see them blooming here very pretty, and the coral bells. Now, these canna lilies over on this side I had for one year, and then I was not able to successfully overwinter the canna lilies in this garden the first year. So I decided to plant something else. That's why I planted the rose. I was discouraged with my lack of success with the canna lilies, but I have since been successful, so I will tell you about that. Now, for the walkway, as I mentioned, there was already a walkway here. So I did have some of the paver base down already, but that walkway was very narrow. So I did have to extend the paver base. I also had to level it out some, and I definitely used my own method for creating this walkway. I'm not capable of putting down the paver base, getting it level, putting down all the sand, getting it level, and then laying the pavers on, which I know is the technique that you're supposed to use, but it came out pretty flat and I'm happy with the way it came out so you can just see it in various stages as I created the walkway. I did start over at the stairs and I just put those steps in first and then I went back to the gate after I had done the garden and moved down toward the stairs to connect up with them. Now moving on with the tour. Now I'm going to turn 
and the walkway continues around the pool. This is a very, very small yard. This pool goes as close to the edge of the property as we can, so we couldn't put the deck all the way around the pool. It's only on two sides. This walkway is a little different here. As we come around, you see I have some lilies. And unfortunately, they're not blooming right now. Only one is blooming. I have this giant holly tree, which honestly, once it was a twig with like three leaves on it and I thought it was going to die, I moved it like three times. This is where it finally landed. And now it's huge. And these were some lilies that I rescued from another part of the yard last year and I built that little wall behind them. And then the walkway continues, it gets wider here because here we have the woodshed and Mr. Crafts the Charm built the woodshed and he also splits the wood. And then I have some raised beds that I built over here. And this one is full of mint. Um, Mr. Crafts the Charm uses that in his cooking. He is an excellent cook. And he just cut out a lot of the mint, just chopped it down because it had gotten quite woody. That's way more mint than we need. If you know anything about mint, just takes over wherever you plant it. And so he cut out some of it just to give the rest of it uh, some sunlight. And then I extended the walkway last year. You can see it's a mishmash of stones and you can see also this is where I keep my wood. So I'm going to insert here some pictures and a voiceover so that you can see the before here because I did take before pictures here and it's pretty horrifying. I'll also show you what this looked like without the willow fencing and how to put that willow fencing in, how it's connected. I don't have video of putting it in, but I can show you what that looks like. And I have some before pictures of the raised beds too. There's a dragonfly. I don't know if he's showing up on the video. They like the pool. The initial version of this raised bed is hilarious. Okay, so this is the same basic view. And you can see that we have the chain link fence. We have a pile of rocks, and that isn't even the rocks that I got from the retaining wall that I had built. These rocks are from other digging because you can't put a shovel in the ground in New England without getting rocks. So there's rocks, there's all kinds of vines. We've got grapevines, we've got bittersweet, we've got honeysuckle all growing over the fence. And kind of didn't mind that because it gives us a little privacy. Our neighbor's yard is right there, so it gives them privacy too. But I really didn't like how overgrown this was. And now this pile of rocks is a lot of the rocks from the underground retaining wall that I dug up. So the first thing I did was pull out all of those vines, which is a huge challenge. I'm sure you can imagine if you've ever dealt with vines. There is a stone wall about half a foot from the fence. So a lot of the vines were growing between the stone wall and the fence, and it's a really old stone wall that's falling down. So anyway, long story short, I got rid of all of those vines. Oh, this final picture is actually over behind the holly tree. Our neighbor's tree had come down on our fence and damaged it. So I was able to actually pretty easily repair that by replacing that pipe along the top and then just reattaching the fabric part of the fence to it. So those white packages against my fence, that's the willow fencing, that's how it comes, all rolled up. And here you can see it, I've unrolled it. And then here you can see it installed along the chain link fence. And so you can see here as we get close to the fence, it's sticks of willow which are attached together with wire. And then what I've done is attached it to the bar across the top of the chain link fence. Now here I used wire but originally I used zip ties, and that's what they suggest, is that you can use zip ties. I just found that in some places the wire was a little bit easier to use than zip ties. So you just hold it up and then zip tie it up, and it'll stay up with just a few zip ties, and then you can go in and add more zip ties to make it tighter. Now, there was no way this was going to look really neat, like that it was going to have a level bottom or anything, not in my yard, but if you have a nice level yard, I think it could look nice and straight at the top. Okay, so here's the first version of my raised bed. 
I thought, let me repurpose all of those rocks. And I built this kind of silly looking raised bed, Mr. Crafts the Charm, and I called it our caveman raised bed. But you can see I planted the mint in it. So when I built the final raised bed, which I built out of some old deck boards, some pieces of pallets, and part of an old swing set, and you can see I repurposed the rest of the swing set to hold my kayaks, but when I built the first raised bed, I had to build it around the plants that were already there, so I sort of built that one in place. And then I built the other raised bed next to it, and I positioned that one sort of weirdly because there was a tree stump there, which I was eventually able to remove. So I think I'm going to reposition that raised bed, which is why I don't have plants in it right now. Okay, back to our tour. And I can show you a picture of what it looked like over here before as well. The reason I have this mix of pavers is because I already had these one foot pavers. So rather than spend money on the little ones, which I think are a lot prettier, I tried to reuse the pavers that I had. And I have, that's why my pavers are such a mismatch, especially over on the other side of the yard. Here I tried to keep it pretty. And if we look at the plants, let's start at the other end. This hosta is the only plant that was always here because even when this yard was disgusting, I had one little garden in the corner and this hosta was in it. I have a picture of the hosta. I had put it in a pot while I was working on the garden and then I put it back and you can see it's thriving now. I have these liriope that I used to border the garden here and you can see I have liriope down there as well. They're also in the little peninsula garden. And the liriope are in cages because rabbits love to eat them. And I've had a few rabbit nests in this garden. So we'll let the rabbits live in here and I'll just keep the liriope caged. I don't think it's too bad. This is a rose and it's not blooming right now. It has beautiful large blooms. They almost look like hibiscus blooms. So that's why I put this particular rose in my tropical garden because the blooms are hibiscus-y. It did bloom once already this year. Last year it bloomed throughout the summer, but I wonder if because we've had very hot weather and I haven't been watering this plant, that maybe it's not too happy. And then next to that I have some lilies, and again, unfortunately, they're not blooming right now. They, I think, are unhappy from the conditions as well. These are cordyline, and this is one of the tropical plants that I'm going to suggest that you buy only once. So I'm going to show you how to take care of cordyline, and at least one of those might look a little strange to you right now, so I'm going to explain what's going on there. These are coral bells, and I just love the contrast of their foliage against the green foliage, and the coral bells are evergreens, so they look like this year-round. Here's more cordyline, and here's some more hostas. Hostas have a foliage that I just love, especially the bluish-green ones, but I thought this little variegated one was fun. It's sunny now, you can see my shadow. Okay, so more liriope. And then here's some canna lilies, and it's really hard to pick up the gorgeous orange color of those. I'm going to try to get closer to them. Again, there's my shadow. If I get closer, I think, yeah, especially if I shadow them. Yes, now you can see the color. 
I love these. I love the foliage. It's got like a chocolatey foliage. I'm gonna shadow this one so you can see the foliage. And then that beautiful orange color. And that's the other tropical plant that I'm going to talk about in this video. And then still more cordyline. Yes, you will be swimming in cordyline if you want to be after you watch my video. And then some more hostas here. And here's a lot more canna lilies. These are a peach color. One of them has already bloomed and the others have not bloomed this year. Over in the peninsula garden, That orange plant is an African plant called Crocosmia. They like sun, and this is a very sunny location. And I find that hummingbirds really like Crocosmia, although I haven't seen hummingbirds on this one. I have a red one in my front yard that I see hummingbirds visit. Now, the Crocosmia isn't there year round. It's only there in the summer. I have Liriope around it. This little tiny liriope is one that was in the other garden that was eaten by rabbits, but I tried moving it over here. For some reason, they don't come over here. You can see these aren't caged. And it's surviving, so I imagine it'll be much bigger next year. And then I have a hen and chickens down here, and that's this long flower that's extending beyond the garden. And those are really pretty, a really pretty contrast to the green that you can see when the crocosmia isn't hanging over them. This shrub is a Silver King Euonymus that originally I had on the foundation on the other side of the property and I moved it over here when we put the pool in and I think it's very pretty here. It's doing quite well. So I want to tell you how to take care of these plants year round and we're going to talk about cordyline which are those reddish plants and we're going to talk about canna lilies so let's imagine that you're beginning in august or september and you bought those plants it was your first summer with them but now we're heading into winter what do you do and i don't have video of this part of the process you've seen the plants and i took that video in july end of july so you've seen what the plants look like now what do you do well with the cordyline, you want to bring those in when the nighttime temperatures are around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to bring them in before the first frost. I brought mine in last year when we had our first hurricane warning, and that was well before the temperatures got that low and before the first frost. So with those, just bring them in. If they're in the soil, then you're going to want to dig them up, put them in pots, and bring them in those plants you're just going to keep in your house. So you're just going to keep them in a sunny location. You're going to water them when they get dry, let them get dry between watering, and maybe mist them from time to time. You might also want to turn them so that they grow straight. So this isn't about bringing plants in though. There's more that you can do with the cordyline, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's now turn to the canna lilies. Canna lilies are a little bit different. You're going to want to let the frost kill off the canna lilies, basically. So when their leaves die after the first hard frost, that's when you're going to bring the canna lilies in. So for those, you have to be a little bit more in tune with the weather and paying attention. So you're going to wait for the frost to kill the leaves, and then you can cut back all of the leaves. So basically just cut them down to about, I don't know, an inch or two above the dirt. If they're in pots, that's great. You're all set. Just bring the pots in. If they're in the ground, dig up around them and put them in pots. Dig up a good amount of dirt around them and put them in pots. Now, if you have a garage, you want to put them in a dark place in your garage. If you don't have a garage, you want to put them in a dark place that is around 50 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit for the winter. So I don't have a garage and I don't really have a place that's around 50 to 52 degrees. I put them in a dark corner of my basement and 
that dark corner was closer to 60 degrees. It was as far from the furnace as I could put them, but it was still about 60 degrees. And that worked fine for my canna lilies. So that's what you're going to do over the winter with both plants. Now with the canna lilies, just leave them there. Don't water them. Now, I did talk to somebody at the nursery. He said that he waters his around February. I didn't, I never watered mine. They were fine. So it's March of this year and I'm retrieving the canna lilies from the darkest corner of my basement that is furthest from the furnace. And the two little ones in the green pots, those were the pots they were in when I bought them and I never moved them out. So they're actually quite pot bound. And then the larger brown pots, I just dug up the cannas that were in my garden with some dirt around them and dropped them into those brown pots. And you could see I kept a thermometer down here so that I could monitor the temperature and right now it's 57 degrees Fahrenheit. So I brought them out onto my deck and this was a little bit makeshift. I did it kind of quickly so I just grabbed whatever pots I had and I had some various potting soils and other components that I put together for soil for these plants. So the first ones that I worked on were the garden canna, the ones that had been planted in the dirt and they were very easy to free from the dirt because they weren't at all pot bound they'd been in the garden and you can see it's a rhizome and it has some roots coming off of the rhizome the rhizome is the thing that looks like a sort of like a ginger root and then it has eyes those are the little buds sticking up that's what's going to grow into a plant so at this point, when you take them out in the spring, what you can do is break them apart so that you have multiple plants. And this is how you end up with more canna lilies. Now the canna that I had in pots, you can see, as I said, they were quite pot bound and it was very, very difficult for me to break them apart. But you can see there are a lot of separate plants here. So there were some very large rhizomes on the outside um, below the surface. So I just worked at those a lot. They don't need all of those roots. I did cut some of the roots in order to get them free from the pot, free from each other. And you can see in some cases I broke them apart, but in other cases I did use a saw on them. I'm not sure if you're supposed to do that. Maybe you're not supposed to break them apart, but all of them did survive. So after I did both of the pots, and both of the in-ground cannas. This is what I was left with after I had broken them apart. And so I just potted them up and then I brought them in the house and put them in a sunny location and watered them. Here's what they looked like after a month, just starting to sprout. And then here's what they look like roughly another month later. So now we're into about mid-May and here we are past the danger of a frost. So I've brought them outside to acclimate to the outside. And again, here they are end of July. I think next year I'm going to start a little bit earlier. And I'm also going to experiment a little bit. I'm going to take some of the canna lilies and bring them in, but keep them in a sunny window with the cordyline because I believe that you can overwinter them that way as well. Just treat them like house plants. So we'll try both methods this year. Now with the cordyline, the way they grow is the leaves die. And when the leaves die, you should pick them off gently. And the cordyline plant keeps growing. So you can end up with something which is very tall like this one. And when that happens or before it gets this tall, you can actually cut this plant and get a lot more cordyline plants out of it. So I will show you how to do that. So here I have one that isn't quite that tall. And this one is pot bound. Poor thing has been in this pot forever, ever since I bought it. And so what I'm going to do is trim this one and turn it into several plants. Now here I have a pot which is full of cordyline plants that I got from that tall cordyline that I just showed you and two other tall cordylines. And I need to make some space so that I can propagate this other cordyline in the same way. So I'm going to take a few of these out and pot them and make a little space in here. And notice that these are growing out of horizontal pieces of stem. 
Okay, now with that space made, I have a pot full of dirt and I'm just going to cut off the top of this quarter line plant and stick it in the dirt. I am going to remove some of the leaves so that it doesn't have quite so much leaf that it has to maintain because it's not going to have any roots, of course, at first. But I am just going to snip it, stick it in the dirt, and then keep it watered. Now with what's left, I'm going to cut off two inch pieces of this long trunk and just put them horizontally in the dirt. And then again, just keep them watered and in a somewhat shady spot, which you could see in my garden that the quarter line are all a little bit shaded. And then with what is left of the trunk, um, because this was pot bound, I'm just going to break up the roots a little bit and then I'm going to plant this and keep it watered. And believe it or not, all of these things are going to thrive. I can show you some examples of what they will look like in a few weeks. So this is one of the really beautiful cordyline that's in my garden right now that's very full. And it was originally a very, very tall one that I chopped. You can see it has a lot of areas of growth on it. Now what I had read is that you were supposed to thin this and not let all of those leaves grow. But I did let all of the leaves grow, and so far these cordyline have been healthy. But I don't know if it's unhealthy for this plant to have so many leaves together. And then this is that same container of the stem pieces, but in the fall. And you can see that up close there are little buds forming here too. Now I have tried one other method with the cordyline. I did cut them and put them in water vertically. And they do sprout roots, but when I planted them in the dirt, they died. So that is probably operator error on my part. I probably made a mistake, but I guess I would say that this method is very, very easy and it seems to work really well. So I would just do it this way, just plant them horizontally. And so you will get a lot of cordyline this way because they grow pretty quickly. And that's it. That's the way that you can care for canna lilies and cordyline and have a lot of tropical plants for your garden in a non-tropical zone. So what did you think of my tropical garden? I would love to hear your comments below, especially if you have landscaping ideas or experiences or gardening ideas or experiences that you'd like to share. I had a wonderful time putting this garden together, but it is a work in progress and I am very open to your thoughts. Thank you for visiting my garden with me today. Take care.